if you want to know the history of surgery before the 20th century, don't bother, because there isn't any. Well, they did some cesarean sections once in a while under general anesthetic, and of course during the Civil War they amputated a whole lot of limbs. But what we consider to be current present day surgery could not have been accomplished without electricity. You have to have a direct light. To have a direct light, you have to have an incandescent lamp. There wasn't any before the turn of the 20th century. Surgeons performed their surgery by candlelight or with a lantern, and it simply would not suffice for today's surgery. They couldn't clear the field of blood with a suction tip as we do now because there was no central electricity. And of course, you couldn't cauterize little bleeders because again, a bovey knife, the cautery, requires electricity. So electricity changed the performance of skillful surgery very much. As for the history of dentistry, there isn't any. Medicine, on the other hand, presented a modest array of successes. Opium alkaloids had been used for centuries to alleviate pain, and a few plants and flowers were used to make some pretty good discoveries. Actually, foxglove, the plant foxglove, was rendered into the drug we call digitalis, which has a very favorable uh, modification of the heartbeat. And a man by the name of Hoffman, uh, back in 1828, he's the founder of what Hoffman LaRoche Labs, he discovered that a garden variety of uh, spirea produced a plant, uh, a drug called aspirin, salicylic acid. Generally speaking though, before the 20th century, medicine was still in the Middle Ages. Physicians up to the turn of the 20th century were still using leeches, bloodletting, and sweating and purgatives to, as methods of restoring health. With the dawn of the 20th century, a golden age of medicine was about to begin. In three generations, more would be learned about fighting disease, sustaining good health, than had been learned in the entire previous millennia. Hospitals themselves are a 20th century phenomenon. In 1800, there are exactly two hospitals in the United States. Currently, as of last year, there were 6,700, which is probably too many. But by far, the greatest progress has come in the area of medical research. In order to have medical research, researchers have to have a method of getting paid. They have to be paid. I mean, amateur researchers, we tried that during the Middle Ages, they were called alchemists, and they didn't discover much. No, you have to have researchers who are funded, and at the turn of the 20th century and a little bit thereafter, huge foundations like the Sears Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation began to offer grants to talented minds and permanent academic posts were established. Research science suddenly became a profession. One of the first things that the research science scientists had to discover was how things work. How does a nerve fire a muscle to move like this? Is it electrical? Is it chemical? Well, research scientists found out that it is both. Um, they found out how food is metabolized. They found out how insulin works to metabolize sugar. They found out that the pancreas indeed secretes enzymes which break down food. It's a great number of discoveries, and with each discovery came new medicines uh, to enhance longevity. Sometimes a medical miracle is discovered entirely by chance. For example, and sometimes they are completely missed by chance. By chance, the word is, the operative word today is serendipity, but it means just things that just happen. Sometimes serendipity doesn't work, and a great principle of medicine so close to being discovered is simply missed. I'll give you an example of the latter. Consider the story of Dr. Benjamin Rush. He was a physician, a patriot, a founding father of the United States, uh, a sign of the Declaration of Independence, and was surely the greatest American physician of the 18th century. In the late summer of 1793, a terrible epidemic overcame Philadelphia. People were dying first by groups of two and three a day, and then by groups of one and two hundred a day. And they were dying of what something was called in those days bilious fever, yellow fever. They were dying of yellow fever. Benjamin Rush's 
patients he found out were dying about the same rate as everybody else's, he said there must be a cause of this yellow fever. And this is the brightest physician mind of the 18th century. He thought about it, he said, I think it's coming from the vapors which arise from the garbage on the wharf of the Delaware River. This must be the answer. However, when patients, people started to die out in Germantown, which is 10 miles away, he said, no, the vapors don't go that far. He really, really tried as hard as he could to find the cause. The disease, the epidemic in Philadelphia died out as suddenly as it had begun. It died out after the first frost. In a morose letter to a colleague after the disease had abated, Dr. Rush wrote of the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia and how brutally it had treated the citizens of Philadelphia. He said in the letter, you know, it was an awful summer because it was so hot and the people were dying so fast of yellow fever. That's the end of that paragraph. In the very next paragraph, <laughs> he writes, that summer there were unusually numerous mosquitoes. Yeah. Why didn't he tie the two paragraphs together? People were dying of yellow fever. The next sentence begins. It was even worse because there were so many mosquitoes. You know, if you just tied it together, he would have um, made a great medical discovery. He missed. It wasn't until 107 years later when, uh, before the building of the Panama Canal, Walter Reed and his group went down and determined definitively that mosquitoes bore the yellow fever virus. Now, let me give you a an uh, example of luck or serendipity where it did work. In the summer of 1928, bacteria, a bacteriologist working in London's St. Mary's Hospital by the name of Alexander Fleming was culturing Staphylococcus bacteria on a Petri dish. A Petri dish looks like this. Uh, it's got a sticky substance in the middle and you put bacteria down and they eventually they grow out in 48 hours on this uh, agar plate, blood agar this is, and they grow out and you can't see the bacteria but you can see the colonies which they have created, the uh, clumps of, of uh, bacteria. So they grow out and you grow all over the agar plate eventually. Uh, when he was doing that, and as Fleming was growing his Staphylococcus that summer of 1928, an, a colleague, another researcher, was growing what is called mold or yeast or fungus, same thing. He was growing mold. Here is an agar plate with mold growing on it. You see the fungus all over the plate being grown. Dr. Fleming took his staff. He was going away for his uh, summer break. He took his staff agar plate and put it up on the top shelf of a secretary a desk. The fellow who was growing the mold left his plate, both of them with the lids off, on the bottom uh, way below his on a bench. They went off for their summer break. When they came back, they found out that they had left the window open and that a blowing curtain had knocked the Petri dish with the mold, the fungus in it, down, upside down, on the open culture of bacteria. Now, Dr. Fleming looked in there, and he had the power of observation to notice the dish, that the dish with the bacteria now had mold growing in it. And whenever the, wherever the mold grew, he noticed that there was a bald area the size of a dime uh, where no bacteria grew at all. Now he showed this to his colleagues. He said, look, look at the areas where that mold fell on my Staphylococcus bacteria growth. There's a bald area. There's a, a denuded area. He said, so what? Throw it away. You know, <laughs> start no, he says that means something. And he was astute enough. Dr. Fleming had the power of observation enough to know this mold is stopping bacterial growth. With that, he extracted what he called mold juice and um, eventually tried it on other bacteria, always found out that indeed wherever the mold was dropped, the bacteria didn't grow. He eventually mass produced it, he tried it on humans, and finally in the early 1940s, beginning of World War II, the mold or fungus was being mass produced in, oddly enough, in America by a company in, in Peoria, Illinois. And because it was, it looked under the microscope like a little pencil, it was called penicillin. And of course, penicillin has changed the lives of all of us, all because a window blew a curtain open and Dr. Alexander Fleming was astute enough to realize the significance of that.